الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers, especially in the back, please come closer. If you're joining us, please come closer. Alhamdulillah. It's, uh, we spent all these days in the masjid. 1.30 is not late for us anymore, right? <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your atikaf. Wa bishrah li sadi wa yisali amri wa hal uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Subhanaka la alman ala illa ma alamtana Inshallah, tonight uh, uh, we'll be spending some time with Mufti Adimuddin speaking about uh, signs of the hour and specifically as we come closer to Qiyamas, how the environment around us is changing and, and preparing us for a Dajjali era. Right? Dajjal doesn't just come out of the blue, but but the same way that we prepare for the month of Ramadan, or we should be preparing for the month of Ramadan so that we could have been productive in Ramadan and taken advantage of this month, that the environment around us in some ways can be preparing us for the arrival of Dajjal. And obviously, the day of judgment that follows. So Mufti Sahib, I think we can start our conversation maybe just talking about where we are today and with what we see going around us, is, is, is Kiyama like next week? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> <laughs> As we always say at the beginning of our talks here that every single gathering we attend is a gathering where life, our, our hearts can change, life can change forever. It doesn't take more than one gathering or even one hour or less rather for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make that as a means of bringing massive long-lasting change in any one of our lives. So every single gathering we sit, we should say, Ya Allah, make it that one. Make this gathering that one when, which uh, I can remember 30 years later. That that gathering became, or that majlis of knowledge and dhikr became the life-changing experience for me. So I hope this one becomes for me and for all of us tonight, inshallah. We should sit in the state of wudu. We should sit in the state of artikaf when we're in the masjid. <clears throat> we should sit with utmost respect for the gathering. And we should try our best to attend from the beginning till the end. A person should try their best that you're locked in in the class. A person should not think that this is like a, a drive through thing. You come two minutes, leave two minutes, come. Then you don't get barakah like that. From the beginning to the end, a person should sit. And when a person has to leave, you should take permission, actually from the one who's teaching before they leave. This is the proper etiquette. And additionally, we should sit uh, as close as possible, try our best not to have any gaps. If someone leaves from in front of us, we move forward. Um, this would be the best. Try our best not to lean on the walls far away from the gathering. Let's try our best to sit as close as possible. And additionally, let's make the niyyah that, Ya Allah, I have come here seeking you. I've come seeking you. You and I, we both need and we both want Allah. And we are hoping to find Allah over here. So, inshallah, you make this dua that, Ya Allah, whatever my emotional, spiritual, physical, mental needs are, Ya Allah, allow the talk and the program that I'm attending to be a means of having those issues addressed. Having my questions answered, my doubts removed, and allowing me to walk away with a very clear uh, path in front of me. The question, this whole topic that we have preparing for Akhirah, right? Basically. Um, 
the this the, like like the previous nights this is not meant to be an exhaustive type of cover to cover course there is alhamdulillah a beautiful course that in the tafim weekend program like we talked about yesterday the fiqh of marriage and divorce is a course that's taught similarly signs of the hour is a course that's taught which you should take and you should read books on it we're not trying to go through all of that here my purpose is for us to walk away from this gathering understanding as you said where we are right now in the timeline and what is expected from us what do we need to be prepared for what are what are we facing right now so from amongst us i remember i gave a presentation on the signs of the hour it's called you know signs of the day of judgment coming of dajjal i think that's what it was called this was back in 2014 or 13 long time ago yeah i remember right. that one yeah it was unbelievably packed it was like a you know khatam night everything in the in the masjid of course only the main room it was super packed event maybe 10 12 years ago and i based that presentation off of one hadith of hudayfa radiyallahu anhu in which there are about 70 different signs that are mentioned and as life has moved on immensely not in 2024 but even in 2015 16 17 i did that presentation maybe twice thrice somewhere else on the road and so whenever i visited that presentation i realized that of course i have to update this because we update its explanation the hadith is there but i have to update the explanation of what this hadith means because so much of what had not become obvious in 2013 had become obvious in the next three years of what very well could be the explanation of that like you don't have to like kind of force yourself for an explanation it's so obvious it doesn't require a teacher it doesn't even require you to be an adult you read it you're like oh that's what's happening yeah straightforward so at that time when we spoke about this topic we kind of came to the conclusion that all the minor signs have already arrived all the minor signs of the day have just been are present and now we are waiting for the uh, major signs and the major signs are 10 that are um, come back to back <coughs> of course the minor signs have arrived that doesn't mean the major sign is now like one minute or one week away because those minor signs now have to become dominant mm -hmm. right you hear what I'm saying like for example if, if, if the, uh, one of the minor signs is, for example, Men will suffice with men, women will suffice with women. That has increased from 10 years a massive percentage. Mm -hmm. But when that becomes, I don't know what exactly, 70%, 80%, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where that's going to become the, like, the, it's going to be the most dominant type of lifestyle. Allah. Uh, then you have, for example, when uh, a person aqa abahu, aqsa abahu wa aqa ummahu, a man will bring his wife real close. He will obey, not bring close. He'll obey his wife and disobey his mother. He will bring his friends close to him and he'll push his father away. That's been happening, mm -hmm. and it's definitely increased now. But it's gonna come when that becomes like the norm in every home. There will be a few that are saved, and vast majority is where. The, women, the mother, like we heard this earlier last night, yesterday, where the mothers will be treated like slave girls. That is all happening in some homes, but then that will become the norm. So we're not just talking about non-Muslims, we're talking about Muslims as well. Yes, yes, exactly. Right? Muslims as well. So Muslims, of course, Muslims. So uh, like these type of things, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, these, awesome. are, these, are gonna, these are things that are going to become normal. Uh, people will be seeking knowledge for something besides Islam. So Arabic will be taught, Islamic studies will be taught, people will learn so much. But then there'll be no practice. And you're like, wait, what was the purpose of that? You studied in the, you went to madrasa, you went to university, Islamic university, you got a degree in this, or you went to hip school. And now you have to stay away from this, this is haram, why are you not staying away from it? I don't understand. Well, you know, that was just something I did. It's just something to do. You know, I did, I did it in my hips, or I did my four years in Islamic studies. It had no connection when it comes to actual practice. Mm -hmm. So most people will start seeking knowledge, not for, not for sincerely trying to obey Allah, but for some other things. Um, you have uh, the concept of Asbah al Ma'rufa, Munkara wal Munkara Ma'rufa, truth becoming what Ma'ruf, something which is virtuous, will, become, will be regarded as vice. Mm -hmm. And vice will be regarded as virtue. 
for sure that has begun. Yeah. So if you're trying to follow the deen, it's regarded as a vice. Mm-hmm. If you try to follow sunnah, you get, you're going to get made fun of by your own family and by the community. And if you do something wrong, then no one will, yani not only will they not correct you, they'll say, mashallah, shabash, it's great. Mm-hmm. If someone were to, I mean, there's a thousand examples of that. Last year's retreat was kind of on this topic. The entire retreat was dedicated to this topic. Last year's retreat, it's available to listen to the audio recordings of it. But it was, you know, how vice and virtue have been flipped. How morality has been flipped. And what we regarded as virtue has regarded as vice now, and what we regard as vice has been regarded as virtue. But that has to become like extremely predominant. So bit by bit, all of these things, you know, from the signs of the hour, shulibat al khumur, and uh, wine will be drunk. Then he said, yusamuna bighayr ismiyah. They will take wine and liquor and they will name it something else. And they will just change the label to mm-hmm. make people think that it is okay. And to, then they'll start drinking it. Um, they will ظهرت الأصوات في المساجد There will be loud, loud discussions and voices in the masjid. Masjids won't be quiet places. Masjids will be places of community building in which you scream and play football and soccer and karate class in the masjid. There are so many masjids. They have literally female karate class inside the prayer hall. I was in another masjid too. They were in the midst of like, we're having a program. I like, I took, we took a tea break, there's, there's football. There's, I'm expected to speak to the youth while literally in front of me, in the chandeliers there too. They're throwing football and having a football game right before I speak. Okay, so the, the sacredness of the masjid is out. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful place that people come. You look at all the major multi-million dollar masjids that are now being built in overseas Muslim countries. Mm-hmm. What are they? They are museums, they are pieces, they are works of art. Tourist attractions. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. The works of art. You're supposed to come, you're supposed to be amazed at the carpet, you're supposed to be amazed at the granite, you're supposed to be amazed at the artwork. It has nothing to do with ruhaniyat, spirituality, salah, nothing. You go there for fajr, you won't find anyone. Right? But you go there for dhuhr, seriously, majority of the visitors will be non-Muslim. Majority. So masajid have now definitely going towards the fact that they become places of, uh, attra- of, of tourist, tourism and not a place of hidayah. Because it's just a building. Right? People who have never, who have nothing to do with deen are building Muslims. Right? So uh, that's a sign of the hour uh, that you're seeing now. You see, Baharat al Qaynat, singing girls will become common. So that could mean, I mean, I used to think before that that would mean that people usually, you'd have to, it would cost a lot of money or you don't have the access to be able to hire a, a, a female singer. But now with our phones, you can listen on demand to any singer. And now you have TikTok and you have all these other things in which pretty much half of the people, that's what they're doing. They're singing and they're dancing. And um, you don't have to hire them for free. You can do whatever you want. So that, that's becoming very common. And then you have um, musical instruments becoming common. Mm. That Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. That's awesome. That musical instruments will become a Muslim home. You know, they'll have your Quran Sharif there and a beautiful piano. They'll have their, uh, you know, what you call their bookshelf with all tafsirs. And next to that, they'll have their guitar. Not only that, it will be regarded as part of nasheed. You'll have guitars. You'll have people speaking about Allah and Rasul. And there'll be millions of views. MashaAllah that this is. Astaghfirullah al So bad. Right? It's 100% pure music. Guys and girls doing weird stuff. And then they're using Allah's name in it. Yeah. So... One thing, you, uh, you know, let me stop over here to see how shaitan gets us involved in all of these horrible sins. Mark my words, it's never pure 100% haram. Because if, you, if that happens, we will reject it. Mm-hmm. You have to ease into it. Blurring the lines. Huh? Blurring the lines. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's why if it was just pure music, the people say, what is this? But then you have it, you have a nasheed. Or you have the praise of the Prophet Then awesome. it's all of a sudden it seems it's okay. Okay. And then, but it's it's 100% normal music. But the lyrics are just Allah and Rasul. You have these, um, uh, you know, uh, horrible uh, covers where they're taking uh, songs of of musicians and then just change 
one or two words with uh, you know Islamic terms especially Allah Rasul my Allah my God and that the lyrics besides are not even changed I've, I've spoken about this before when people say um, oh I like which you know XYZ English you know Nasheed artist like okay what is the basis oh. the basis you know it sounds good so one practicing brother who his kids have no exposure to music he's like this Nasheed artist came to town so my daughter my son they have to go see him and I said why are you taking him there like well because what's wrong they sing Nasheed's then I pulled out a song, one of the most famous songs, and I said, look, look at the description of it. And who is he giving credits to? He's giving credits to Drake, the famous, you know, Canadian uh, musician who has got some of the most vile and most lewd lyrics out there. Mm -hmm. At least that I have come across. I'm not into music. I don't study it either. But some of the lyrics I read, I could not read beyond the past three lines. It was too, too bad for me. I was like, I can't, I can't take this. Literally those were the original words this Nasheed artist used. And he changed one, two words and put Allah and His Rasul's name in it. Yeah. How can we allow ourselves to listen to that trash? Don't you think that's making fun of your deen? What is this supposed to mean? If someone, subhanAllah, is drinking, is, takes a, a, a Budweiser and puts Zamzam in it, are you gonna drink it? You, you would say, this is istihza with deen. If a person leaves salah, it's not kufr. If you, as long as you regard it as necessary. But if you pray salah without wudu intentionally, that's kufr. A person drinks alcohol, that's not kufr. But if a person says bismillah and drinks alcohol, that's kufr. Because making fun of deen, a symbol of Islam, a symbol of the deen, is something which gets you out of the fold of Islam. Wow. So when people, I'm not saying, listen to this nasheed, is taking out the fold of Islam. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to say, is that we are playing with that. Where you take something which is so purely, purely, purely filthy. If you were to give me water, a glass of water, and fill it up from the bathroom sink, mm -hmm. which is 100% same Lake Michigan water. Mm -hmm. I did that once to my dada. He got so mad at me. Rahimahullah. And he got so mad. I'm like, I was just playing with my trucks or something. He said, bring me water. And I was like, quickly, the bathroom was the closest. I just got it in there. He got so upset. <laughs> then I made this mistake of giving him water like this. No <laughs> tabakaro. Right? <laughs> this is how you hold a lota. Right? You don't give water like that. Yeah. This is where I goes back to my conversation yesterday of the benefit of living with your grandparents. Mm -hmm. You learn etiquettes. Right? So, and parents, of course. Um, um, so, the, what was this talking about right now? Yeah, so the idea that you can take something as disgusting and lewd like that, mm -hmm. where the devil probably feels shy, and you throw in a few humming sounds and a few names of Allah mm -hmm. a few times and our kids are now reading, listening to it, enjoying it yeah. how can you expect any nur in that? there's gotta be zulma, darkness in that there's gotta be darkness if, if the basis of something is haram you take $100 of riba or, or stolen money and you start up a business that $100 haram is always gonna stay there you usurp someone's property and you build some a masjid on it how does that work? Your basis is, is, is filth. So when we have these type of programs, I'm sorry, this type of nasheed and things like that, what is shaitan trying to do? He's trying to ease us into getting accustomed to taking in poison. Instead of saying this is, you know people say, brother, this is a cover, it's meant to weed off for people who are addicted to it. Mm -hmm. Like this specific boy mm -hmm. that I'm speaking about, he never listened to music. Mm -hmm. His mom and dad do not listen to music. But he innocently thinks this is a nasheed artist, so I'm going. So it's actually reverse. Yeah. Instead of him getting further away from music, he did not need to be weaned off of it because he was never listening in the first place. Yeah. There's a lot of plenty amazing nasheed artists out there. Good stuff. But take someone who doesn't base it off of music or especially the disgusting lyrics. This is a deeper issue here. That what we're seeing is more and more types of innovations are happening in the name of Islam. And most people, the average man says, that Shaykh, you know what? I see where you're coming from. You know, but it's not all that bad. At least there's some good. This is, you'll see the most common response to anything you say. Whether it's music, whether it's mixed gatherings, whether it is dancing, whether it is social media, whether anything and everything you want to talk about, mm -hmm. this is the response. 
that at least it's not pure haram. That person, if you heard, you know, he said one thing wrong, but mashallah, his other, his other statements or his other fatwas or his other lectures, they're all awesome. Mm -hmm. And so my response to you, my dear friends, is this is exactly how shaitan works. Because if a person were to come out 100% pure filth, you can't get yourself to promote your material in the community. There's a slow method you get into. And that is you present a topic or an idea or an ideology or an action as Islamic to be able to sell it to your crowd. Okay. And once they buy into it, it already has that 5%. But the goal is that not 95%. I mean, the one who's involved in, he doesn't even know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. It's Iblis in the back, who actually says, I need to get these people. You know the same thing about the story of Barsisa. No, sorry. The story, the story of which one was that? The one with the, um, the monk and his... Huh? Uh, uh, was that, was that the one with the, 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 the one where he ended up leaving Islam? Barsisa, huh? right? Was it Barsisa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He made the dua. Uh, was, yeah, not the one with the... the, with the yeah, huh? Yeah, was it Barsisa? Yeah. Okay, so that's a great example right there of a story that we've all heard of a person whose brothers... Uh, a person who... a monk who was entrusted a family to take care of who's, or a girl who's take care of because her brothers had gone out in jihad in Bani Israel time. And he was said, since you are trustworthy, you're the scholar, you're the monk, you take care of her. You see, if Shaytan came and said, okay, this, their three brothers are gone, go do zina tonight. He's, out the billah, you crazy? I worship Allah, I haven't gotten married my whole life. How dare you, Khabis, I will That's what you would say. That's why Shaytan never comes like that. He comes in a very quiet, silent manner. And he comes like, wait, doesn't she need help? Let me look after her. But the brothers told me. The brothers told me to look after her. And the story, as you all know, starts off with basic help and eventually ends up becoming a father. Long story short. Now, what should he do? So now he's faced with that. He says, I can't, the, you know, shaitan then, when you're in, caught in trouble, he makes you do stupid things to get you even deeper into trouble. So what does he do? He ends up taking her life and taking the life of the child. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just bury them. What are you talking about? Of course people are going to find out. So that's what he did. He, buried, he killed both of them, two murders, and threw them in. Eventually, when the brothers came back after one year or so, they started finding out, asking, and they pointed out that this is what the monk has done. And so they, they grabbed him, they charged him with murder, and he was sent to uh, get executed. And as he's hanging there, uh, uh, you know, uh, by the noose, Shaytan pops up. Hello, here we go again. This time, he comes in person. Previously, he didn't come ever in person. This time, he comes in person and he says, Listen, my friend, you're caught now. You got about 30 seconds to go, and you're dead. The only, no one can help you besides me. Like, what can you do for me? Can you get me saved? Yes, I can. What do you need from me? I need you on, as your neck is on this noose, to simply put your head down like this, showing that you are prostrating to me. That's all I need, a nod from you. And he says, okay, anything to save my life. And as soon as he does that nod, of course he runs away. And the noose tightens and the, the, the plank beneath him is removed and he dies on shirk. Mm -hmm. Worshipping shaitan. Started off from being the monk and the most pious of that entire region. Yeah. How does it happen? It happens slowly. And this usul I'm telling you, we need to all understand very well. The shaitan will never come at you straightforward. Never. Because he's, he's not in business since 1920. He's not in business since 1492. He's not in business from 570. He's in business for billions of years. It comes in hadith. When Adam alayhi salam was created, shaitan looked at Adam alayhi salam's mold. Mm -hmm. And right then and there, he started thinking, where are the flaws in the system that I can um, use and I can take advantage of to get to him? Mm -hmm. He's crooked. He looked at Adam and says, Oh, mashallah, this is the new baby. Oh, no. How oh, can I mislead him? That was his thing. So he's in business for billions of years. You can't mess with him. We talked about that on the Black Magic Day too as well, right that night in that discussion. So if we understand this, then all these new fitnas, you'll realize how shaitan will come and pop it. You read Qasas al-Nabi, remember? 
Qasas al Nabi in the story of Man Kasar al Aslam. Correct? That's the beginning yes. of everything. Who broke the idols? <laughs> but when it comes to Nuh alayhi salam's story, part two, part three, mm -hmm. huh? what does he talk about? All the prophets. He's how does Shaytan so successfully get each nation, get each nation into idolatry? Wait, come on, man. You guys did Tawbah, you had a prophet. How, how, how do you get to worship in idols again? Shaykh Abdul Hassan Ali al Nadi writes it in such a nice, beautiful manner. He would make the followers of the Prophet after the Prophet die say, Oh man, we miss our Prophet. He was so nice to have him around. We don't have him around. Can you draw, draw a little, can we have a drawing of him? Right? So they would come up with a drawing. And after a while, some people say, This, this drawing doesn't do justice to him. How about we just create a statue of him? Just for the sake of memory, so we can look at it. And by looking at that statue, we will remember our Prophet. By looking at our Prophet, we'll remember Allah. We'll become more pious, so we'll become more focused in our ibadah when we see the statue of our Prophet. So they created a statue. And then after a little while, someone's like, I mean, Shaytan is coming to different people and giving these ideas to them. Mm -hmm. They're like, wait, statue doesn't do justice, man. We need to create an idol who we can actually just straight up do sajda to. But the purpose is not the idol. The purpose is Allah. The only reason we put our head down towards the idol is because this is one step to get to Allah. We have to, where did you get this stuff from? Where did you get this stuff from? This is shirk. No, but don't worry, I'm getting there. مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ Zulfa. We are not worshipping these idols except for the intention of getting close to Allah. So even though their intention, huh? even though their intention was pure and they had a correct intention, they could still end up in kufr. They ended up in shirk and kufr. But why I raise my voice right now is because that's exactly the logic Shaytan is playing today. That Shaytan says, "Brother, no one wants to come to the masjid." That's false. Look at you all sitting here, right? What are you been paid for? Who, what, what are you doing? Do you go out? Why are you came? You make effort of the hearts of the people. People will come. But anyway, this is sh people, no one comes to the masjid. So now in order to get to the masjid, now you have to build your way up. And you build your way up through haram. They say we have to do haram activities, otherwise no one will come. From, or if not haram, extremely reprehensible. We have to, have, we have to you know, think about all the things. For whether it's a, 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 we have to watch a movie together in the masjid. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to have a, what you call, a, 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 watch the World Cup. No, I'm not saying it's haram, but some aspects of it, if it's naked, again, anything below the knee is, is, is satar. The knee and below is satar. Mm -hmm. So if you're showing that, that's haram. No doubt about that. As much as you and I may have gotten accustomed to it. But to show that in a masjid, mm -hmm. the intention is great. We want to get people in the door. We need to get the youth in. And the youth won't come without movie night. The youth won't come without Super Bowl. Okay? Like show. A youth will not come if it's just a guy's only event. Mm -hmm. You have to, have to, if you want people, it has to be a mixed event. Otherwise, people won't show up. Okay? So, will people, will more people show up? Of course they will. If you have Super Bowl, will they show up? If you have a, this game, yeah. Just call Drake himself. <laughs> call for Khatma Quran, have Drake. Khatma Quran, have Justin Bieber. Their brother, they will, we'll have traffic jam till Army Trail Road. Say <laughs> At what, at what cost are you willing to get the masjid filled up? What that what? This, the logic, I gotta get the people in the masjid. And you gotta uh, twist and turn your, what you call it, the rules. Drake doesn't have to come and uh, give a sing. Maybe you say you don't, he just has to come and give an appearance. Maybe say, you know, just say a few words. Uh -huh. And uh, it doesn't make a difference. The place would be beyond and beyond packed. But what about people that say at least well, they're in the finish this. So, the uh, question is, where do you stop? I'm giving this example. Mike Tyson, long ago, mm -hmm. 90s, he had a fight or he went to Scotland. And I was in South Africa and I read this in a newspaper. Okay. He, went to South, he went to Scotland for a fight and then they said, oh, let's try to get him for Juma. He went on a shopping spree. The tabloids were talking about how much he spent on a watch and all that. Wow, stuff. okay. So then they announced that he's going to be in Juma. And a scholar from India, if I'm not mistaken, Mawlana Salman Nadwi, but I could be wrong, but I, I have a recollection it was him. Mm -hmm. Very famous scholar from India. Then he was his bayan. But they said, oh, he's coming. So the Juma was supposed to be like 11, 12 o'clock. They waited 12, 12, 30, 1. They keep on calling his agent. Oh, he's busy, he's busy, he's busy, he's coming, he's coming. All the way till 3 o'clock, Asr time is about to start. Then said, so we have to, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So they announced it and they said, Mike Tyson is not going to be able to make it. Sorry for that. So the brother was telling me, 
who was there mm -hmm. he said a big chunk half of the crowd or so stood up and left without praying Juma. without praying Juma. because they didn't come here for Juma. they came here for Tyson that's the litmus test when you remove that drug mm -hmm. how many leave then you know who's coming for the masjid mm -hmm. and who's coming for something else when you remove the bait how you have to do that if you just yeah. keep the bait on every single day, mm -hmm. day or every week you'll never know what's happening yeah you have to test it out remove the bait one week and see how it goes but even if it's a bait it has to be a halal bait yeah it cannot be a haram bait is what i'm trying to get at okay but these things that are happening are not happening by ill intention islam hating individuals they genuinely care about islam and deen but what happens is like I am susceptible to shaitan and so are you and so is every single human being. We just get attacked in different ways. Shaitan may come to them and say that the reason uh, I'm doing something which is not 100% halal, only 90% halal is so that eventually I can make it 100% halal. Mm -hmm. Or eventually I can get people to a higher level, higher mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. So that is where I feel we're falling into the same trap. Where I was thinking about this today. How, could there be anyone more gung-ho and more spiritual and more hardcore than the Prophet ﷺ? Imagine the Prophet is saying, okay, you know what, subhanAllah, you're, you're, not, so, you're not so close to the deen. Mm -hmm. Let me kind of allow certain things here for you to get you into Masjid al-Nabawi. Yeah. Right? Imagine that. The Prophet ﷺ was not working with a liberal Muslim. Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ was not working, sitting with yeah, any people who are just kind of whitewashed. The Prophet ﷺ was working with the most hard-hearted, the most staunch disbelievers mm -hmm. who hated Islam, hated the Prophet ﷺ. But yet, what does he say? When they asked him to compromise, he said, La ko, lakum deenukum deen. I can't compromise. You want it, you come through. You want me to change my ways? One day I worship your God, one day worship, I worship her. He could have done it in the name of inner faith. Why not? Mm -hmm. If it will bring the people in, it yeah. will at least get rid of the animosity in Mecca. Things will become nice and easy, and then we can practice Islam. Yeah. All they're asking is, one day you worship our idols, and one day you worship your Lord. One day we worship our idols, and one day we'll worship Allah. That sounds like a deal to me. I mean, that's a way to fill up everyone, and there'll be no more fighting, no yeah. more antagonization. We all live bye bye as brothers. But brother, then why did you even come with a new religion? Khalas, leave it. Let let, it, let shit continue. The fact that Islam has come, it is about starting something fresh and remove the filth. So we learned this from the Prophet ﷺ, that in issues, on fundamental issues, there is no compromise. If someone says, I said Muhammad Hanwi's story, the guy wanted to become a Muslim, yeah. but he was habitual, Hindu, drinker. Okay. He's only a Muslim. The, brothers, the villagers said, no brother, he, he, liquor and uh, this, he, uh, wine, this is haram. Mm -hmm. So he said, this is haram, what does that mean? He said, you can't do this. He said, forget this then, I'm leaving. So then Muhammad Hanwi got so upset. He said, but why did you not just allow him to accept Islam? Mm -hmm. Because why? Drinking is not a part, it's not shit, it's a mm -hmm. sin. Yeah. And he is not a already Muslim. Mm -hmm. He's gonna become a Muslim. Okay. And when you become a Muslim, you're not saying that you're allowed to drink. It's just that we will work, we're gonna still call we're gonna call a spade a spade, a snake a snake, a sin a sin. Mm -hmm. Drinking is not allowed. We're not saying it's allowed, but whenever you have the him and the tofi to give it up, that's mm -hmm. when you give it up. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So there's a difference between someone leaving kufr to coming to Islam and the one who is already a Muslim. Now let's talk about already a Muslim. If already a Muslim person says, he comes to you, and like this is, I don't know what you guys think, we, I deal with just people like all day who are angels. No, I'm not an angel myself and I don't deal with angels. I deal with everyone else. I deal with people like myself, people who are sinners. So they will come and say, I, I don't pray at all. So what do we say with them? Okay, start off with Juma once a week. Or start off with one Isha. Yeah. Not to say the others are maaf. We're not gonna say that. But we're gonna say start somewhere. But the goal is very clear. You have a path. Yeah. This is your mentee and you're guiding him and leading him from one step to the other. And we're not giving them something haram to work with. In yeah, exactly. Right? You're, not yeah. Giving, you're just saying that it's hard for you to give this addiction up right mm -hmm. now. If I tell you, to, if I force you, we're gonna leave. I'm not gonna give you something else. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna make sure that whatever your um, status quo is, we'll keep it at that and we'll change it. So similarly, let's give an example of hijab. Some sister who comes and it comes into the masjid. I'll give you an example of one of our summer classes in the mm -hmm. past, recent past. I was told from our sisters, teachers, that the first day during the summer program, 
a girl shows up, short mm -hmm. sleeves, open hair, no scarf, but of course she's on the sister side. Yeah. No one said anything to her. She spent the whole day studying. Mm -hmm. But she's looking at every single other person who's got this nice scarf and are willing, are, all of them are wearing full sleeves and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So she comes back the next day, no one tells her anything, she herself starts wearing a scarf and whatnot. But then with her, she tags along her sister, right? And the sister who is also, they're coming from like a secular family. Yeah. SubhanAllah, she's like, okay, you got to walk like this. But by the third day, a third sibling she brings in. Wow. And all of that she learned through osmosis. Mm -hmm. No one told her anything, right? This is the, all of you who have gone out in Jamaat before, you know that in Jamaat, they don't give fatwas. They don't say, brother, is haram. This is haram, this is haram. It's the fact that when you sleep on the ground, you follow the sunnah, you get up for tahajjud, you are eating, you're staying away from the mahol outside in the masjid. Mm -hmm. You yourself, you start realizing your own mistakes. And through osmosis, you, you change. My mm -hmm. father's life-changing story. He says that when he went to uh, the Ishtima in New York in 1984, mm -hmm. the year I was born. He said what changed him was the fact that he went with his three-piece suit, he went with his shaving kit to the Ishtima. Someone said there's an Ishtima in New York. And when he went there, he said, it was so spiritual. Mm -hmm. He had no idea what Tabligh is. He had no idea what this is going on. It was so spiritual that there were six police officers mm -hmm. who were guarding the Ishtama site. By the dua time, all six of them had accepted Islam. Mashallah. No, there was no pamphlets of those days probably. And no shoving things, t-shirts, all that. No table, no booth, mm -hmm. no pens. But what they did is they witnessed something that they hadn't seen before. They witnessed true Islam, at least a small group of people staying awake at night, doing ibadah, doing khidmah. It captured their hearts. They're like, this is it. We want to be Muslim, 1984. Mm -hmm. So my father says, during the time of the dua, I started seeing all these people crying like babies in front of Allah in the final dua. Mm -hmm. And he said, I looked at myself, I'm like, man, these guys all look more pious than I do. Mm -hmm. And look at how they're crying. What about me? I should be the one who cried more than them. He said that was a like, you know, life changing experience where he said he looked at all these people who had beers and he didn't have it. He said, okay, that's one, definitely I need to start making some changes. This, this was like the spark of it. Mm -hmm. But it was, there was no bayan and lecture about how to dress. There was no bayan and lecture about you can't do this, you can do this. That's what we need to realize. You create a good environment for people and people will follow the culture. So if you want to see change, if you want to see hayat, you want to see taqwa, you want to see piety, you want to see following the sunnah, mm -hmm. give people an environment. And they will naturally start going with the crowd. So it's about surrounding ourselves with good people. Surrounding yourself, because what I'm saying is people think that, oh, there are so many people who are away from Islam, how do we get them to the deen? Mm -hmm. My standard answer to every single person so far was asked me this. I have a sister, how to bring her to the deen. I have a brother, how to bring, I have a mom and dad, how to bring them to the deen. Standard answer always is, please don't talk about their flaws. They don't wake up for Fajr. They don't say, come on, you gotta start waking up for Fajr. It's gonna backfire. They're involved in haram business. Say, Baba, you have to sell this. This is all haram. I'm not gonna eat at home anymore. I don't think, you know, it might not work. But instead, what it is, instead of speaking about people's mistakes, you allow them to come into the light. Mm -hmm. When you give them an environment that's enlightening, they themselves will do some soul searching and figure out that what I'm doing is wrong. Wow. So I think, that's the easy answer for all loads of our problems. Mm -hmm. Give people good environments. Okay. Now when you talk about good environments, the environment has to actually be a good environment. If I am sick and you pick me up from, or you pick someone up from the uh, street, you take them to the hospital. Outside environment is freezing cold, for example. Outside mm -hmm. environment where you picked up this drug addict mm -hmm. is with needles everywhere and drugs everywhere and liquor bottles everywhere and a bunch of other druggies. Now you picked him up, the paramedics came because he has almost had an OD. So you picked him up, you took him to the hospital. And you say, okay, now we need to do rehab. In order to do rehab, are you gonna say, brother, we have to make sure he's comfortable in this environment. And in order to create comfort, we need to make sure his environment in the rehab center is similar to what it was on the street. Otherwise he will run away. We have to have some nice needles, we have to have some nice variety of drugs, we have to have a nice variety of alcohol, uh -huh. we have to have some, another similar type of addicts around him, uh -huh. so that he, does, he feels comfortable and he can warm himself up into this environment. And then eventually a day, inshallah, one, two, three years later, while he'll be racking up millions of dollars in bills, he'll say, you know what, today I'm done with this. The chance of that happening is very unlikely, mm -hmm. if any. Rather the chance would be that since we picked him up on the street, now we have to give him an environment that's an antidote to the environment of the street. It's not cold, he has warm shower, warm meals, you know, love, 
compassion, mm-hmm. subhanAllah. And of course, no drugs. Instead, mm-hmm. medication, instead of dhikr, ruqya, various other type of things you're using to be able to, a, med- a meditation, a therapy, uh, you know, fi- uh, different types of things to keep him busy and try to find good company. And mashallah, inshallah, that person will be able to get out of that habit. So when we bring people from the streets, what do they need? They need an environment that is far better than the environment that they have outside. Otherwise, we're not going upwards. We're just going, you know, mm-hmm. uh, from one side, one side of the fence to the other. We have, we hasn't, it hasn't been an improvement on that. So I think the intentions are good that you want someone to be comfortable with. But I, I'm telling you is that if you give exactly what he had outside, uh-huh. he's not going to benefit from that. So the simple thing is we have to have more masajid and more conference places and more conferences, more mm-hmm. retreats, uh, more musallas, where the environment is powerful, super spiritual, and extremely welcoming. And where a person can come in dressed in however, mm-hmm. of course within the same gender I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> and a person is not going to get questioned, okay. a person is not going to get judged, a person is not going to get dirty looks. And a person instead is, give, is getting that a spiritual dose that they need to to be able to appreciate what's out there and what changes they need to make. So this is, I know we had a, a longer conversation, maybe a longer talk that I've given here, but I think this sums up the signs of the hour that come, the smaller signs of the hour before the Dajjal, is that each one of these are, not 100% of them are sins, mm-hmm. some of them are not. Like for example, tall buildings. Unless they're built only for show and competition, which <laughs> is the case. But fi nafsi in itself, it might not be a sin, a major sin. We said that these, sin, these minor signs have to become super common mm-hmm. before the jal comes. Yeah. Because from all the major signs, the first one of those major signs is the jal. It's the jal okay. So going back to where we started off, that 10 years ago when we spoke about it, already mm-hmm. those 70 signs were present, yeah. the minor ones. We've seen them become more prevalent in that but time. But now, in the t- past 10 years, these 70 signs have become much, much more prevalent. Mm-hmm. So we're definitely getting closer to the first big sign, which is the Dajjal. Okay. And how will even the Dajjal come about? Mm-hmm. How will he become someone who's got power and people will be willing to follow him? The same way the first 70 came through, which is small, easy, slow exposure until you become accustomed to it, you become desynthesized to it, and you don't think it's a big issue. And you take it in. And didn't the Prophet saw some so kind of warn the Sahaba about this? Like, shaitan is not going to try and mislead you in big things. But he's going to try and do small, small steps. Okay. They are, mashallah, all those who are listening online. If you have any pertinent question to our topic, then inshallah, please kindly uh, write it out in the chat. And we'll have someone address it. Yes, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allahu Akbar. I think he said, uh, he, Iblis has had become mayus. He's become dis, uh, despondent from you immediately going back to shirk in Hajjazir al Arab. If I remember correctly, that you're not going to go back to shirk in Hajjazir al Arab. What's going to happen? It's going to be hatred, disunity, ostentation, riya. These are the things he's going to get through, get you through the diseases of the heart. The biggest disease is shirk and kufr. But he's not going to get you through that now. But then the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned towards the end of the times, if you, any of our mashallah ulama are here, you're more than welcome to look up these things and send me the nusus. That the day of judgment will not come up, come until the idols. La uzza. And the idols will once again be worshipped in the Jazeera al Arab. And so this was something that you're like, whoa, is this going to happen? And that time has? Worse. We came. We've came. seen it. We've seen it now. Came. Uh, it's came. It has come. That we have now an ambassador says in a speech openly that we don't want to be known. I'm paraphrasing this, but we, we are not a country that, in, uh, that needs to be 100% identified as the birthplace of Islam. We, were, we already had our culture before. We already had our thaqafa and we had our ways. Islam happens to come into our place. So our identity is predating to Islam. This is in the full of, you know, at Oxford, in front of everyone, a very open speech. 
where he says we don't want to be identified as Muslims, right? Mm-hmm. That's a secondary identity. Yeah. First identity is uh, being Arabs. Um, and, and so part of the Arab culture, of course, Arabs worshipped idols. Mm-hmm. So now you have major national museums have brought out those idols where you can go take a look at them. And people are retweeting and posting that this is awesome. We're able to rediscover our culture. A lot of that is happening across the Muslim world, yeah. across, in many different cities, so in many different countries. So what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said has, has started happening. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about how the deserts of Arabia will once again become green and lush. He said once again, we didn't know that, that mm-hmm. but now scientists and geologists and historians are saying actually long, 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 long ago, these places were actually green and lush. Then the patterns changed and weather changes and erosion and whatever other things have happened, that they became deserts. And now Rasulullah said, it will go once again back to it. So if I don't know if when's the last time any of you went for Umrah, at least for the past two years, if you take the journey from Medina to Mecca, the mountains literally are green. People have messaged me and said, what is this painting? Is this part of like some vision? Like what's going on? They said, no brother, that's not paint. That's actual green trees. It's so green. Um, you have now uh, uh, um, uh, huge farms where wheat is being grown Mm -hmm. um, and other types of grains are being grown and irrigation is happening. SubhanAllah, basically Rasulullah prophesies this huge change of the entire geography, entire weather. Um, The Prophet said, What is that? Qaydah. That the rain will become hot, like hot ash or acid rain. Mm-hmm. And no matter how, how much it will rain, it will still remain hot, global warming. Right? He, he says, And the children will become a source of extreme anger for their parents. Parents won't want to have kids anymore because of how much pain they will get at the hands of the kids. So these are things that are just continuously happening across the globe. Okay. Um, and the half, we were talking about this earlier, so and I think half the questions are on red cows. So I, I think uh, the, red cow, the, the gist thing, of... <laughs> red, red cow, gist of it is, um, is, this, is this, there's truth to that, there's a biblical prophecy about it. I did not look into it, but I know it's all over the news. Um, and I don't know why that made it out to the news, but okay. It, uh, you know, the idea is that when these, these three red cows are going to be slaughtered, mm-hmm. then uh, it will usher in an era where the, uh, where the temple will be rebuilt again. And according to them, this will give the Yahud the license or the world events will allow them to destroy uh, Majd Aqsa. Mm-hmm. And um, this is where they will say they will build their temple. So those are things that more than likely are going to happen. Um, whether it's going to happen with the red cows or not, there are ulama who have spoken about it. You can listen to those scholars. They're online. I didn't look too, too much into it. But this is nothing like... What I'm trying to say is, like, that we should expect this. Mm-hmm. This is exactly where we're going towards. You, you know, we don't. It's, whether it's in the Hebrew, whether it's in the Torah, or um, why do we need to like feel shocked about what's happening in the Torah? It could be true, but we already have all the signs pre- present from the Hadith literature. So these type of things, oh, definitely, we should expect. Um, the the war that has bro- this genocide that has broken out mm-hmm. within the first. I'm sure all of you, most of you, were you heard about it the first day. It was that 9-11 moment for me. You know, I was, in, I was studying overseas. I didn't have internet, I didn't have phone. Someone went to an internet cafe and then came back and s- told me at night, Isha time, in Madrasa, that, oh, this would happen. I couldn't believe it. But then they said, what happened? I was 16 years old and I started to cry. And all the people around me didn't understand they were in this frenzy, oh, the way, you know, kuffar, they, they harmed us so much. I was there like, what are you, what's wrong with you? I said, you guys, you guys don't know what you're talking about. This is going to change your life and my life. And I was crying. Alhamdulillah, I, you know, I think most of us realize that, that the world is not going to be the same. There's nothing, there's no positive elements. Yes, of course, people accepted Islam for sure. Yes, but there was any, there was, you could have accepted Islam that's, that's the silver lining and everything we have to always take out. That's good, because it's already spilled milk. What can you do? But there's nothing to, beyond that. 
So similarly, when this October 7th, right? Yeah. Happened, where was I? It was in Chicago when I heard about it. Coming, um, uh, I think more no, coming back from St. Louis from a program. Mm -hmm. And that's the exact same feeling I had. This is now something else. It's not your normal skirmish. This is going to change the world, the world. And that's exactly what it seems like it's, it's, it's happening. Things don't seem to be calming down. Things are unfortunately expanding. Um, and by it's, it's, it's meant to happen. Whatever's mm -hmm. meant to happen, we can't stop it. We have to play our role. You cannot stop the hour from coming. You cannot stop the jail stay outside. Don't come, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> we have to make sure that we're just in the right place at the right time when he does come or whatever happens. Hopefully, hopefully the right place at the right time, inshallah, will be under the grave, right? under the earth. Right? If every single prophet asks Allah, warned his nation from the job, and everyone is begging Allah to protect them from the job. Who, which fool today would say, no, I want to I wanna join, I want to be there to check them out. Right? No, there's nothing to check out. We should ask Allah that He removes us. This is one of the du'as. Oh Allah, whenever you intend to put a nation into trial, please, please call me back. Call me back mm -hmm. without falling into fitna, because I can't take fitna. But I think it would be safe to say, right, that our actions or any other group's actions cannot bring Qiyamah closer to us or push it back further. It's going to happen when it's going to happen. A, it's, it's a statement. They, it's, it's, they sacrifice the cows or not, or the third temple comes or not. Yes, it, it is a, a figure of speech. Mm -hmm. You don't get it. So when people are doing things in the world right now, mm -hmm. Muslims do. Yeah. It's a figure of speech. What the, they, that was meant to happen. They're going to do that, and Qiyamah will come at some point in time. They're not actually changing the time of Qiyamah. It's just the fact that these guys are becoming Allah has willed that they're going to become the actual reason why the path will be paid for, for the Dajjal to come. Okay. So a, a couple questions we got here along the same lines. Is Hopefully the, we're answering. Gigi, we're going through the, yeah, yeah. So a couple of these say, is the Dajjal going to come in our lifetime? Do you think that's going to happen? I have no idea, my friend. I, you know, <laughs> I have no idea. Are the Dajjal supposed to come in our time? Could be. Could be not. Because the way things change mm -hmm. is so quick. So fast. So quick. So quick. That it very well could be. But we can protect ourselves with Surah Kahf. And, and one answer that our Honorable Ustad, Hafidahullah Mufti Allah Haq has told me, and I mentioned this in many talks last year, two years ago when I asked him about this, mm -hmm. about Mahdi and the job. This is an answer that is, gives you us hope and also makes us cry at the same time. So I had given him a Darussalam calendar and I was talking about the Darussalam programs at his home with him, asking for his dua and whatnot. Then the conversation shifted to somehow Mahdi and Dajjal. So I asked him not about Dajjal, I asked him about Mahdi. People are asking for Mahdi, is he coming? What are your thoughts about this? I asked him. So his answer was that Mahdi is nowhere coming, nowhere near. Okay, why no way near? Because he said, when Mahdi comes, the Ummah will be in such, such, such pitiful, horrible, difficult circumstances, the likes of which maybe have never been witnessed. He said, you're surely not going to be having a Daru Salaam. Mm -hmm. He looked at it, he said, you're telling me you're doing programs? You have thousands and hundreds of people attending? Mm -hmm. He said, where's Mahdi going to come? Like this. SubhanAllah. He said, when Mahdi comes, to be a Muslim and to be a believer will be next to impossible. And people, anyone who has faith will be just khalas, destroyed, killed, tortured, you name it. And so being a Muslim will be one of the hardest things. And those few Muslims who will survive the tests and will not cave in at all costs, they will still remain Muslim. They will beg and beg and beg and beg Allah and when their dua reaches at a certain threshold, then Allah will send Mahdi. So, yani it's, that's what I'm saying, it's a bittersweet answer. But the aspect of it, when he comes, it's, it's like, we're just getting started, brother. We're just getting started. Another ustad of mine, in this past Umrah, when asked about this, he told me that this Palestinian crisis and this genocide is not going to bring Mahdi. Okay. He said, I said, how? 
He said, at least look at this. This is also very scary. He said, because you are able to, although the countries are not able to do much, but you as a citizen are able to still raise your voice. You're able to voice your opinion. You're able to financially try your best as an individual to help. But soon a time will come, whether that soon is a thousand years, five hundred years, a hundred years, mm -hmm. that the Muslim bloodshed will happen all over the world. And at that time, it will be so difficult to assist a Muslim that a Muslim will not even raise his voice for another Muslim. Because raising his voice will make him a target. Will not even will not even have ability to protest because he knows that he will get into he will be a target he said that's what's coming wow man I don't know if you heard what I just said and he even specifically highlighted to me Southeast Asia he said this bloodshed is gonna come here unfortunately we see what's happening like the Spanish Inquisition we're seeing things unexpectedly that the life uh, the, the, the on the ground situation in, in the country where my parents were born, which we'd call homeland, subhanAllah, changing so rapidly. So these are things that we need to study and understand. And we cannot continually sit in our banglas and drive our cars and relax that everything is set. Nothing is set. Nothing is set. The future is very, you know, uh, difficult to gauge. But it seems that Allah Azza wa Jal has decided to put the heat up. Because as we get closer to the Day of Judgment, the heat will continue to go up. And at the very end of times, or especially the Jal, that is when you go from 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and then what do you come? What is it on your oven? Broil. Broil. The Jal is broil. Have you ever thought, tried toasting bread on broil? Try it. It won't last five seconds. Everything burns just like this. As we get closer to the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is increasing the heat, meaning Allah is going to increase the tests. And only people with the highest level of deep, deep, deep rooted Iman will survive. And the number of those survivors will continue to more than likely diminish. Mm -hmm. Because quality over quantity. That quality will be amazing diamond quality, super rock hard. Like how gold is purified, diamonds are purified, extreme levels of heat. Similarly, this is what fitna is in the first place. Fitna means the purification of gold. Fatan is the jeweler who purifies gold. You take mined ore and you put it under heat. And you, of course, amongst many other things, and so all the non-gold substances and all the other uh, dirt and everything gets pushed away. Mel uh, all the other alloys get melted away and you have a pure, uh, you know, pure gold that's then made into something else, bricks and things of that sort. So you can think of it as just like a fatan puts up the heat to purify the gold, Allah is going to put up the heat on the, on the believers and humans. And the ones who remain firm, they will become 24 karat. But understand that the heat is going to get higher and higher. So, Mahdi comes when the temperature is way up. Okay. What we have seen now is the temperature going up, but not enough up for Mahdi to come. How long will it take from 200 to get to broil? 200 to 400? Allah knows best. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. It could be our great grandchildren's time, it could be our own time. We don't know. So you talked about, and I want to go on this, you talked about it getting more difficult as we go on. And we stand at basically the dawn of the AI era. So I want to talk about this and kind of how the, this loops in with this, where um, we see you know, the advent of deep fakes, and we talk about uh, deep fakes and other things like this, and when you can see someone that you know on a screen, but he's saying things, and you know, for example, I have a video of you, but saying something that you would never say to me. Or, or other scholars that we have, or they're saying they're, they're quoting the Qur'an, and it, maybe it sounds like Qur'an to us, but we're saying this is not Qur'an. So we're, we're coming to an era where we won't be able to, to believe video. You know, before video used to be the end-all, be-all. You have a, a dash cam, you know who caused the accident. Exactly. But now you can't trust your dash cam. 
So as we begin to enter this era of, of additional fitan and additional difficulty, how do we differentiate what's right from what's wrong, what's true from what's false? You know, this, this, what you just said, it, it just kind of brings tears to me because I'm just thinking about how hard it's going to be to survive. Mm -hmm. Most people won't make it. Most people won't make it. I don't even know we'll make it. If I'll make it. Because that's exactly what you just said. The intersection, there's no, there's no doubt about it, or in my mind, mm -hmm. that the Jal is the zenith of the latest technology of that time, mixed in with some hardcore, highest dose of sihr, the sihr of shayateen. Mm -hmm. That coupled with the highest levels of technology of that era, what I never heard of AI until, what, two years ago? Mm -hmm. Maybe? I don't know. Most of us never heard of it. And that research was already being done in the early 2000s. Yeah. Early 2000s. So we're hearing about this 22 years later, 23 years later. Now, the train is moving. It's moving fast. To take off the train and to create acceleration takes time. But once it's now accelerating, it's going to quick, quick, quick. Look how those boxes go in front of you. That's what it is. The development of AI, I, I was just, if you remember last year, there were 600 AI scientists who signed a petition mm -hmm. asking government to intervene or asking companies to themselves self-regulate to stop research in AI. And they said, take a summer break for six months because this is getting way too dangerous. Uh -huh. It's getting out of hand. And so please, let's not get into this until we can take a step back and think, how are we going to actually live in this world? What type of laws and rules are we going to create that will allow us to live in this world? The cat is out of the bag. Of course not, right? It's a race to the top of evil. Yeah. So no, nothing stopped. But now they have said the year of 2024 is going to be the year of the fastest development of AI. The 2024, we already, we're only three months in. If you check mm -hmm. online, just type in Google News AI, or go to NPR now, which is once in a while I check, has an entire section daily dedicated to AI. Every day. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much that's newsworthy, not research worthy for a scientist. No, uh -huh. newsworthy for consumption of you and I. Every single day, that's how much development is happening. Get it? So by the end of December 31st of 2024, where will we have reached? I have no idea. Now you've read so many things. Man, I mean, it, it, I don't even know where to start, man. I don't know where to start. If you just look at AI being used in the uh, genocide right now. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about that? Right? In, in, in Palestine, what are they using? They're using AI to be able to, um, uh, what you call, Tar used drones to target. So it's no longer a human being. First of all, they said it's, you, you create, when there was a person who would take a sniper and shoot, there would be some element of, let me think, it's a kid, should I do it, should I not? It's a girl, should I do it or not? Then they relegated that to drone operators thousands of miles away, mm -hmm. who will, while, while drinking their coffee, are using their joystick to blow up a, a building, right? So that was bad enough. But now, they have 100% dedicated this, relegated this to a machine. And so this is what he says here. One intelligence officer says, this is unparalleled in my memory. A statistical mechanism, right? And he says, we have more faith in a statistical mechanism than a grieving soldier. Everyone there, including me, lost people on October 7th. The machine did it coldly, and that made it easier. Right? So now he says, um, it's saving us a lot of time because I would invest 20 seconds for each target and do dozens of them every day. I had zero added value as a human, apart from being a stamp of approval. Now this saves a lot of time. This is an IDF soldier speaking, correct? Yes, yeah. exactly. And he says, IDF judged it permissible to kill more than 100 civilians in attacks when they were trying to focus on a Hamas official, which I don't think they even got. So uh, he says, two sources said that during the early weeks of the war, they were permitted to kill, permitted to kill. 15 or 20 civilians during airstrikes on low-ranking militants. Attacks on such targets were typically carried out using unguided munitions such as dumb bombs, in which they ended up destroying entire homes and killing all their occupants. 
So he says there were regulations, but they were just very lenient. We've killed people with collateral damage in the high double digits, if not low triple digits. If not low triple digits, this is all collateral damage. All right? It's not just that you can kill any person who's a Hamas soldier, which is clearly permitted and legitimate in terms of international law, but you directly tell you you're allowed to kill them as long, along with as many civilians. So he says, even with AI, there's a 10% error rate in identifying even targets. And once mm -hmm. they identify, everyone around them is also taken out. That's one example, which is unheard of, yeah. right? This is something uh, you know, new that's happening. Okay, one major thing that is worrisome, yeah, we should, he says, experts studying potential impact, of, I'm, I'm reading to you from various articles. Experts studying the potential impact of advanced AI have concluded that the biggest risk of AI and robots comes from the potential manipulation of people. Brainwashing is much more effective and cheaper than military action. Brainwashing is much more effective and cheaper than military action without any bullets. Humans are using AI to create and spread fake news, which is killing wisdom without firing a single shot. Which is making people not care about their own identity, not care about their own people, not care about what they grew up, what they were taught to care about. And so you don't have to even kill them. They will actually now, it's like the science fiction movies where you actually have mind control and the human becomes a soldier for the aliens. That's exactly where we're headed. Where how do you mind control? Well, you control because we're all addicted to our screens. We're all taking in. So as long as you adjust what's on the screen, we believe whatever the screen tells us. We believe whatever, the, whatever we hear from the phone, watch from the phone. So you just have to change the channel Oh. and put the right stuff in there and it will make people start thinking in a certain manner. Wow. But that's not it. When I said, what you're looking at Dajjal, you know, how is he going to claim God? Whenever you said this to people, they'll say, oh, come on, man. Who's going to believe a human being in this God? That's the basic answer, right? Who's going to believe a one-eyed human being to believe in God? That's usually the ishkal and the criticism about Dajjal. Probably if you have criticism or if you have doubt about Dajjal, you're probably not sitting here. But maybe you are or you know someone, so I'm sharing this information with you. That because Dajjal is supposed to be the very largest and last and biggest, most difficult challenge, it's a broil. It doesn't get hotter than that. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal has made it in a manner that's vastly different from anything else. All the other signs and all the other fitnas, they have been, oh, I won't say all, most of the big things have been mentioned clearly in the Quran. But Dajjal has no spe special specific mention in the Quran. And this is what the Quranists say, mm -hmm. or the hadith rejectors say, that who is, you're posting stuff on that, right? Someone read it, you shared something. That's what it is. They say, oh, the hadith doesn't, hadith, there's, who cares about hadith? We want Quran, Quran. We follow Quran. You know the Quranic, Quranist movement and the, 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 the throwing out all Khabar Ahad, anything below Mutawatir. I wish you can connect the dots. This is happening at the highest levels. This is happening at the highest levels. That only follow Quran. Mm -hmm and only follow mutawatir hadith, which aren't that many. And they definitely probably do not mention Dajjal. I'm sure they don't, right? I could be wrong, but someone can do the research on that too, let me know. But mutawatir hadith doesn't. There's few, and those mutawatir don't, don't speak about it. Mutawatir means there's such a long, large group of narrators in every generation that it is given almost the authenticity similar to Quran in terms of its preservation. Mm -hmm. Deen, if you base your deen off of that, it doesn't work. Because that's a tiny, minute percentage of hadith literature. So what has been done, if you say Quran and Mutawatir Hadith, you've literally thrown out majority of the deen. Or at least I should say the source of the majority of the deen. And now when you don't have the source, well I become the source, or you become the source. We use our own intelligence to figure things out. So part of this fitna of the Dajjal is to get people to start focusing only on Quran, mm -hmm and start distancing themselves from hadith and saying this doesn't make sense and that doesn't make sense and we gotta find a reason to make sure that this is proven wrong or weak because it doesn't jive with me. 
Picking and choosing our deen. Picking and choosing, right? So, I remember I gave a talk one day about the job in a khutbah. After I was walking out of the masjid while wearing, grabbing my shoes, an uncle comes up to me and very sarcastically, at least I recognize the sarcasm, he tells me, MashaAllah, what a good khutbah. Oh, the jal ke baare mein hamne zikr kiya. But wo Quran ke koon se surah mein hai the jal ka zikr? He says, Oh, you talk about the jal. Can I tell? Can you tell me what surah is the, uh, is the jal mentioned in? Which surah? Obviously, I knew he's a Quranist. He's a hadith rejecter, and that's why he's trying to say, "Why are you wasting our time speaking about the jal when there's no mention in the Quran?" And I told him. I mean, I think it's one of my, you know, mupart days. I was just like, just <laughs> tell it as it is. Uh. I said, "This is part of the fitna." So people like you actually reject. This is the fitna has already begun. This is the example of the fitna that you come and tell me there is no Dajjal because it's not mentioned in the Quran. This is exactly why it's not mentioned in the Quran. For people like you to trip and fall. Because you already fell. That's the idea. Because if, if, you, if you say, you know, Dajjal is there, I believe in it, I'm going to protect myself, then you can't fall. When you become a Dajjal rejecter because you're a Hadith rejecter, you already lost the game, brother. You're not even going to get into the first round. Mm -hmm. So this is, where, this is what's going on today. All those Hadith, hadith rejectors across social media platforms, huge following. And you have these pseudo intellectuals out there who, who are uh, who constantly, the, you know, are uh, saying, "Yeah, this is old old village mullah's tales." Come on, 2024 in America, you're going to talk about the job? So they're constantly pushing this narrative that stops speaking about this. Why don't you try to put this, you know, uh, put this as a topic somewhere and have? Some of these intellectuals to come speak about it. They won't. Mm -hmm. They'll say, no, this is absolutely irrelevant. There is one hadith that when the jal comes, the jal will not come until the jal will not be spoken about from the pulpits. When he will not be spoken about from the pulpits is when the jal will show up. Because if you have retreats and conferences where you speak about the signs of the hour, then we're not going to fall for it. There has to be absolute no mention of it. Then he will pop up and he will take over. Now, when, when, if you, I talked about a bunch of things right now. The fact that hadith rejection is part of the fitna. Once you reject hadith, then you won't even know what a fitna is anymore because you lost your table, of, you lost your map. Hadith is your map. It tells you who's what, it's your identifying guide. If you lose it and you throw it and you reject it, you're not going to be able to figure out who's what. You have to have hadith in order to figure out who's what. Second thing is, when people talk about how will I start believing in a God like the Jah, how is that possible? What we need to understand is, nothing will happen immediately. I already told you today my monologue at the beginning, very important monologue, that everything happens subtly. Change happens subtly. You know, you scoot over, you want to try to get to someone, scoot over, scoot over, right? Little hips kids, maybe trying to get out, right? Scoot over, but then he just scoot, 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 scoot over. That's what it is. This Dajjal, he's not going to show up one day. Here I am. Of course, no one's going to believe in him. So he has to slowly make himself more acceptable. And then by that time when he comes, people will literally be dying for him. I want you to think about all the sins that are prevailing in today's community. Just YouTube shorts. All the YouTube shorts of Ramadan that are there. I mean, I just opened, just opening up tonight's program if you, on my phone. If you open it up, it'll show me all the Ramadan shorts. The type of stuff that is being promoted by Muslim content creators on YouTube, shorts or TikTok, is something so haram. While wearing a scarf, while growing out a beard, while saying, my name is Salma, my name is Ahmad, my name is Khalid, my name is Fulan, is something we would never imagine 30 years ago would happen. Say, mm -hmm. how would you Every person would say that. The guy who doesn't pray would say, I don't pray, man, but I don't do this crazy stuff. That show that you should, this morning, or you know, I said this excerpt of this, what? In one of the shows anyway. Hmm. But basically, it's the non-masjid going crowd. It properly depicts that non-masjid going crowd. But the non-masjid going crowd is just going so far away from the deen that they are not just going far away from the deen. They actually intentionally make fun of the deen. The, what I said earlier, saying Bismillah, to drink wine mm -hmm. and alcohol is kufr. Drinking alcohol is not. If you regard it as haram, it's not. Because when you play with it, with the deen, that's where kufr. So the, the environment is being made outside such that people are just becoming so uh, accepting of things which were absolutely not acceptable before.
So it's just slapping that Muslim label on something haram and then people that don't have the knowledge or, or are looking for a way out, pick that up and run with it? Yes, exactly. I want you to think about, for example, AI, um, uh, you have the bots, but then you have another, another moment, even when ChatGPT, right, last mm -hmm. year came out, for, at least for us, I had tears in my eyes. Someone brought it to my office, said, oh, check this out, one of our brothers. Honestly, I was crying. Because I knew we've taken a giant step towards the job, through that. When I saw that power in the phone, even though it's, it's still in infancy stage, my gut instinct said, this, although I benefit from it, honestly, it's, it's a really nice tool, but I don't care. It's still going in a very, it's taken us in a whole, it's a leap year, it's what you call it's leaping years worth of travel towards the job. So, so now that's just the basic level, what we're coming at. McKenna, I want, I want um, uh, what you call, I want to read something to you about which just gives me the, the you know, uh, the, the actual reason why I think the Jad and AI is how this works hand in hand. Okay, okay, listen to this, guys, listen, listen. I know it's you're tired, but just listen, you know. The more, this is from Sh Chicago Booth, uh, Chicago Booth.edu, this is UFC, right? UFC, right? yep. UFC, Chicago Booth School. It's an article from there. Look at this. The, the more exposed people are to automation technologies, researchers find the weaker their religious beliefs. Again, I repeat, the more exposed people are to automation technologies, the researchers find the weaker their religious beliefs. AI and robotics may influence people's beliefs in a way that science more generally does not. People whose jobs were one standard deviation higher than average in exposure to AI were 45% less likely to believe in God than those with average exposure. Did you guys understand that? I'll repeat again. People whose jobs were one standard deviation higher than average in exposure to AI were 45% less likely to believe in God than those with average exposure. Meaning, those people in university or in workforce who had a slightly more exposure to artificial intelligence, research, studying, working with, uh, developing technologies, if they had a slightly more exposure to it, that meaning they spend one hour reading about it while the average person spends three minutes. I mean, that's not one standard deviation, that's too much. Okay, one standard deviation is less than that probably. The chance of this person who's reading about it, for example, an hour, the chance of them believing in God is 45% less than the person who reads it, doesn't read it all, reads it one minute a day. Meaning, this is this crazy, crazy virus. Why is it a crazy virus when maybe tonight's title was presented by ChatGPT or Meta for our talk? So, you know, why is this, why is this so, so dangerous? Look, the researchers find that the countries with a large stock of robots, one standard deviation above average, experienced a 3% decline in religiosity each decade. SubhanAllah. By contrast, countries with a stock one standard deviation below average experienced a slight uptick in religiosity. What does that mean? That any country that had a little bit more robots than an average country, there was a decline in people believing in, uh, in any religion. And any country that had less robots than the average country had an increase in religiosity. Mm -hmm. Brothers, you can listen to this afterwards if you're falling asleep. But this is crazy. This is exactly what, what I've been thinking about. And Autom I'll... Oh, no, I'm not done yet. Automation here. Automation's impact on religious faith may have to do with what researchers call the instrumental value of religion. Religion, they say, researchers say, it provide, it's an instrument of coping. Religion helps you figure out why things, give you an explanation of why things happen. Mm -hmm. So he said, historically people have deferred to supernatural agents and religious professionals to solve instrumental problems beyond the scope of human ability. For example, you say, hey, you know, I'm, I've got things moving around in my house. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten sick so, uh, uh, randomly at Maghrib for the past six days. I get a fever and after Maghrib is gone. What's this about? Right? I get these type of questions all day. So what happens? You go to a religious leader. What is it? The doctor can't help me, I need this. So people historically would go to religious leaders and religion and masjid. Why are you in the masjid? Man, my mom's in the hospital. Man, 
I lost, I got in a car accident twice this week. Man, you know, my relationship is broken with another, my girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, I come in the masjid. So people would turn to God or a superpower, natural, supernatural power, for help in dealing with things that go behind them. He said, these problems may now seem more solvable for people working and living in highly automated spaces. Khulasa ye is that AI at its infancy already is coming up with so many solutions that people will literally eventually say, I don't need mom, I don't need dad, I don't need a secretary, I don't need a driver, I don't need a baker, I don't need a, 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 a guy to fill up my gas or make my coffee, and I definitely don't need a mufti. Definitely don't need a... Right now they already have an AI mufti app, right? Right? Alhamdulillah, where are you? Right, so they all, that's already present. So, but people get the khush, yaar, ye to zabardast hai. Right now in the Haram Sharif also, I don't know if you know, they created, they've removed all the Imams, uh, they, sorry, they've removed the ulama, who used to give answers there, and now they got kiosks. Oh. Two years ago, or a year ago. They got kiosks there for asking fatwas. Now, I don't know if they are 100% AI, or they're humans on the other side, but that's, of course, I'm just trying to say. This excitement over technology is stupidity. You have to understand this technology is a double-edged sword. If you do not, if it's like, it's the villagers that were given a gun. And if they just get trigger happy, and like, oh, let's try this out. Everyone's gonna die. You have to understand, you have to hold with caution, man. You have, to, you have to know how to use this thing. Otherwise, you're gonna kill yourself. And that's exactly what AI is gonna happen. That it's gonna bring automation and, and supernat it will make supernatural, it will seem like natural things are supernatural. And that's exactly what Dajjal will do according to Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa That he will show so many miracles, he will bring in front of you paradise, he will bring in front of you hell. That will look like it. Like a deep fake. Mm -hmm. Next level, Dajjali deep fake. What, is the, what does Dajjal mean anyway? What does Dajjal mean? What does it mean? Huh? Yeah, right? Deception. The Jal is the superlative form, right? It's Sultan someone who is the most deceiver. And that what is AI effort is going on? Now we, we talked about right now how Astaghfirullah, this is going towards mm, uh, uh, what you call this blackmailing people. Taking mm. someone's picture, Astaghfirullah, I just read an article right now. Taking someone's picture online and now putting it into AI and remove the clothes from them. And now send that, which looks a pure like a normal body, send it over to someone's email, WhatsApp, and say, if you don't pay me $500, I'm gonna share this. Who is gonna believe that this is not me? Because it looks top onwards 100%. Bottom, below, no one knows who, how they look. Mm -hmm. And then, you, if you make, you create one, you create another guy's, or another girl's picture, put them together. Yeah. Like you just think, that scholar who is warning people from the job, that scholar who's warning people from that, how easy it is to create a deep fake of him and another girl. And say, whoa, ah. you want to go sit and listen to him? Look what he's doing. You understand that? So the power of how these things can be used to control the narrative. Basically, I want you to understand that my dear friends, our spaces where we can freely speak are going to get smaller and smaller. You have to have your mind and your heart has to be the place where this communication happens. You're not gonna find large conferences speaking the truth on these issues. Because these Dajjali forces that are fully in action right now will ensure that the narrative from every main platform supports the agenda. And anyone, and any narrative that is against that agenda will be silenced. Doesn't mean killed. You can, you know, you can create some crazy uh, scandals. And you can't show your face. Because now everyone's like, who's gonna believe you? I have so many things in my mind right now, but I can't share it. Because, you know, I don't want to get So, but remember, there, there's, there's things already happening. There's things so much happening. Well, like, there's so many things happening. Ask Allah to allow you to see it without me having to say it for you. Because I can't say everything. But I want you to ask Allah to allow you to start seeing these connections of how the narrative is being controlled. One person had a dream as soon as COVID happened. I've shared this before, but many people weren't there before. A pious scholar had a dream on the first week of COVID lockdown, four years ago. In it, he is thinking about the job. He has heard the job has come out. So he starts searching on his computer. Uh -huh. Then where is he? And as he's doing that in his dream, he turns around 
and he sees him in his backyard. So he starts running to his relative's house. And when he arrived at his relative's house, he shows up there. He said, I want you. And I don't remember the entire dream, but one part of it was, the, towards the end of it, uh -huh. was uh, one person was basically, uh, you know, a man was removing someone else, another man's un unwanted hair. Towards the end of it. <clears throat> or it was saying, this is what needs to be done. This was the dream, right? one dream. Uh -huh. I'll explain it. The way it was explained, or the interpretation of it, was when something is in your backyard, it means something is really close. And something could be very close either by distance or by time. <coughs> so it's one of the two. The Dao is very mm -hmm. close in time or distance, right? More than likely time. <coughs> Number two is the fact that the scholar was looking for it and heard about it, was searching it. And that's exactly where he showed up first. Mm -hmm. Is that the Dajjal's focus will be on people who have the capacity to warn others about him. The Dajjal's focus will be to silence those people who are wanting to warn their communities. Scholars, speakers, lecturers, anyone who's got a mic, mm. or any content cr creator on, online, social media yeah. content creator. The first target of shaitan mm -hmm. will be to get buy out all of these influencers. You've seen with the bots right now, you know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Of course, any pro-Palestinian voice, silence. And all of a sudden, you have these bots working 24-7 automatically, generating fake news on one side. Similarly, anyone who's got a mouthpiece, they will be forced to... Uh, did we not hear Michigan? Um, a, a person was offered, Muslim, uh, what, he was offered 20... Millions. Million dollars, 20 million dollars to stand and run against the Muslim in a primary. Straight up, thank God he was actually old Imam. Who would usually say something like that? MashaAllah, he came up and said that. This, you think it's not happening everywhere? It's happening everywhere. 20 million, 200 million. Everyone is bought out by, by certain powers. So that was the experience. And then the, the removal of the hair type of thing, it was the fact that, this was pretty interesting interpretation of that. That removal of unwanted hair is necessary. You know, surgery or someone needs to do, like, I, I have to because that's necessary. And you might need someone's help to do something which is necessary. But the goal is actually the promotion of Fahsh LGBTQ. But it will be done in such a, again, slick slide manner that it will seem that it's a necessary evil or not even evil, it's, it's necessary. And mm -hmm. then eventually just go all the way out. The second dream that the same person had three days later mm -hmm. was of they're going out in a in woods somewhere in a camp. And um, everyone's in the, in the campsite. And all of a sudden he opens a door and he senses the jal there. So he comes back and he tells all the family members, everyone's camp, let's get out, get out, get out, get out. And there was a, I think specifically he said a phone charger or a laptop charger was present there as well. So he goes out to warn them and then he comes back to get it. And that's where he comes face to face with the jal. And the jal looked like a specific person in his family with a white beard and a really pious look. So he's telling his khandan and his family, this is Dajjal. And they're like, what are you talking about? Are you nuts? This is Fulan ibn Fulan. This is our elder of our family. Why are you? You lost it? You've mm -hmm. lost it? And he's like, no, I'm telling you it is. And they're like, no, he doesn't look like it. He's like, I can see it. It's him. And so the idea was the fact that, which we all know, the part of the Dajjal and part of the deception is that he will present himself as honestly the barrister or the, the one who will save Islam. And the one who's there to revive Islam. And the one who's there to make your life better. And to get you to Jannah. And all that good mm -hmm. stuff. With you know, whatever techniques you'll use. But the person who's following him will not realize that he's Dajjal and his shaitan. Obviously not. They will think that this guy is the real deal. So this is a four-year-old dream. Mm -hmm. uh, of a very pious person. So it's a lot of take-home points in here. But the idea what I'm trying to say is. If you take your knowledge and your deen. And you spend half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours scrolling on social media, you've already lost before the battle has begun. I promise you. Because you, don't have, you will not be able to think out of your own. You will not be able to think what you need to think. You will be regurgitating. Hold it, hold it. You will be, regurg you'll be regurgitating what the social media says. One brother came up to me yesterday, uh, this Fajr, maybe he's here right now. He said, Shaykh, you know what? How do I handle. Uh, you know, in, in university right now, girls are the ones who are much more outgoing. 
we talked about marriage yesterday, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was here for the marriage talk. He said, girls are the ones who are much more outgoing and they're just like right in your face. And they're ready, they're the ones who make the moves. As a guy, like how are you supposed to handle that? And how are you supposed to stay away from fifth nine school and college, everywhere? So then I asked him, how long have you been here? He said, I just came here for the first talk. It's Frederick. And I said, brother, you stay here till, uh, till Ertakaf ends and your question will be answered. Not that I'm going to give you the answer. You'll figure out the answer yourself. Because when you are in this type of environment, you get cleansing of your mind. And a lot of the things that you have forced yourself to start believing in, that it's not practical to follow Islam today in its true sense. Mm -hmm. It's not practical to follow the Sunnah in its true sense. Those are things that have been fed to you through what you have absorbed through online, social media, and videos, WhatsApp, you know, everything, Instagram, all that. And of course, our educational system. Yeah. Creates that skepticism. You understand that? It requires sitting here for 10 days, 5 days, 3 days, for us to be able to unlearn that gunk and come back to fitrah. Many people say, I'm going to come for Ramadan and, and read Quran. And ahtikaf. I don't want to come to Dar es Salaam and do ahtikaf. I want to go do somewhere else. Which is fine. Or I'll come to Dar es Salaam and ahtikaf, but I'll never sit in a program. And I'm telling you that they have absolutely incorrect understandings of Islam, incorrect understandings of following the deen in this time and age. But they're sitting there reading para upon para, Jews upon Jews, doing their dhikr without attending any lectures. Their mindset is the same. They don't walk away with a changed mindset. And that doesn't help you. Mm -hmm. you. You can read less Quran, but you have to learn how to think right. If you think wrong, and if your moral compass is messed up, that no matter how much dhikr and dua you do, until you don't go fix that compass, it's not gonna help you. Going for Umrah and Hajj is not gonna help if you don't fix your moral compass. Going for Umrah and Hajj is not gonna help even in Ramadan. If you do not go fix your internal compass. You get what I'm saying? Or no? Because most people, they don't recognize and realize that they're thinking wrong. Mm -hmm. Why is it a person is going for the last 10 days Umrah, in Ramadan with his wife and daughters, who none of them wearing hijab. He'll go, they wear it in the haram, and as soon as they come out to the hotel, it's already off. And then they'll come back right back to America or wherever, yeah. and life is moving on. Same life. What does that mean? That means your morality, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, unfortunately skewed. You haven't realized that what was the point of spending $6,000, $8,000, and go spend $1,000 a night in Mecca while committing a haram, not even repenting from a haram. What was the point of that? You'd rather just stay here and sit and change your mindset to say, okay, this is something I want to change on. This is what I'm giving an example. Whether it's men or women, the key thing is not just doing a lot of good deeds. The key thing is having a proper Islamic vision. And I have met people after Jummah, okay? I have met people after Jummah who came to ask me a question. And the AI and other things. I have met people after Jummah to ask me a question. I promise you, when they ask me the question, they're wearing white though. Asking me a question. In my heart, I'm thinking, is this guy's Juma even valid or not? Because the question is so outlandish. Where he's straight up criticizing the deen. But we just finished Juma. And he's wearing a kurta. What does that tell you? This is, this is so common nowadays. That people are thinking that we just gotta get into the masjid and pray. Get into the masjid and read Quran. Show up to a conference and that's it. My dear friends, if your internal direction of your heart is messed up, your belief of what's right and is wrong, is that not taken care of? We're going to be in for a big surprise. And so this is something we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Guidance. These are why these... When we talk about fitnas right now, this is the biggest fitna. The fitna of not being able to distinguish right from wrong. And the technology that is around us is what is making it much, much more difficult. So I am, that's why I'm encouraging everyone to create and find spaces like these. We cannot have one Darul Salaam or one or two masjids. We cannot. Every location needs to have a masjid where a person can have very clear, frank discussions about deen. The board member, president is not gonna come fire anyone. People are not gonna get in trouble. Say, this is what the deen says. I'm just letting you know. You know, clear discussion. This is not happening today. I'm asking you all, if you benefited from this discussion today, or any of the candlelight discussions, 
You cannot stop there. We are too little in the world. We need to replicate these type of programs and these type of discussions across different parts of the country and the world. There is still a lot of hope people are willing to listen. People are willing to change their perception. But they need someone to talk to them. They need someone to spell it out. I haven't done justice probably explaining to you what I wanted to explain. Um, it's, it's just too much. But maybe even if you understood some of it, hopefully that will open up things for you to start looking. That's why one of my du'as that I make for myself and for all of you is, Ya Allah, give us that light of Iman which will allow us to see the plots of Shaitan and Iblis from miles away. I mean. We, gotta, we, gotta, we just got to know it. We just got to sniff it out. A mile away. Number two, then allow us to take all the necessary means to protect ourselves and the others from it. So create, you know, make a, make a habit of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. So this is our t uh, retreat, annual retreat. I know you've seen the flyer, but that's not enough. I want you to take a moment right now, and if you can register for it, if you, I don't, is the next slide a QR code uh, for it? Who's got the computer with them? Yeah, right? So, oh, it's there, okay. So just take a look at it. Fi May 10th? No. No, I think it's from the office. That's yeah. something else. Let's go back. There, you go. yeah, that was it. So please, take your phone and, and scan that. It's a free, free retreat. There's no registration cost. But I want you to please do it right now, all of you who are listening online. Please stop right now and register for this retreat. It's a free retreat, May 10th weekend, here at Masjid Darussalam. This is going to be the combination, combination of scholars, ulama, muftis, as well as AI experts who are Muslim, practicing Muslims with him. That's what it is. Okay. It's not just any AI Muslim. Because actually, interestingly, some of the biggest leaders in the AI industry right now are Muslim. Muslim. Wow. Big, right? But we, we, we're not calling them because not, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that there are people who are actually religiously mm -hmm. inclined and have some background in deen. Yeah. So this is, uh, inshallah, a life-changing re retreat. I, I'm requesting you to please invite your family and friends from across the country. Let's make this the largest, most well-attended event of, our, of, of, of Darussalam. Say inshallah. inshallah. And make it also from amongst the most beneficial ones that will completely help us change the way we see the world. There's going to be separate women's program, girls' programs, boys' programs. Like for example, there's going to be a session where a female AI expert is going to address women, how AI targets women in a harmful manner. There's going to be a topic for youth, how AI targets adolescents. Right? The goal is there is gender and age separation in how AI is being used to harm people. Is there benefits in it? Of course there are benefits. Mm -hmm. But you have to have some laws and rules to follow. Islam is the only religion, the last religion standing, that can provide solutions, that can provide explanations, that can provide ethical value, ethics and values to developing technologies. Honestly, I was telling the brothers that there's a need for an annual retreat on developing mm -hmm. technologies. Because every single year, we are getting into uncharted waters, right? Navigating new frontiers in the modern world, new frontiers is every, every single year. So we're saying the Quran and the Sunnah, 1400 years old, can give us guidance on how to deal with AI being developed in 2024? Exactly, 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 exactly. Because Quran and Sunnah will tell us the importance of tradition. Well, Quran and Sunnah will tell us the importance of you don't take your deen from a screen. If you don't believe that ideology and you think it's good enough to take your deen from a screen, mm -hmm. game over. Because as you just rightfully said, the era of deep fakes is already here. Just right now, recently, there was a... Yeah, he wasn't too malicious. But there was a, a video of... Uh, there was an, a WhatsApp video audio of Mufti Taqi of Mani, Dama Barakatum. Sounded like him. And they plastered his picture on it, of the WhatsApp. Saying to read this dhikr on this night and this, this, this. Then Mufti Taqi Saab responded three, four days later saying, This has nothing to do with me. I never prescribed these type of things. Okay? This is just the starting of what's going to happen. So people who want to take their deen from online classes only, mm -hmm. via video, virtual, virtual learning, you're going to be in trouble. You have to go back to the good old method of sitting in front of your teacher, who you can shake hands with, who you can study with, who you know you're speaking to a person, who has his ustad, who you can go visit if you want. Mm -hmm. 
That's what I'm talking about. It's the, if you follow the Islamic teachings of how Quran and Hadith have been preserved, inshallah there's safety in that. Inshallah. So I think we're, we're wrapping up. So before we go into dhikr and dua, we had a lot of questions. I think we answered most of them. Um, there's a lot of fit questions. So I think those can be answered separately. So the person who asked if the jail is coming from Pakistan, we should, we should talk afterwards. Um, but I think one, uh, one, one thing I wanted to, that came up a couple times and people texted, how do we, pro how do we protect ourselves from the jail and the, these fitan that we're going to be experiencing yes. coming forward? Mm -hmm. the, the, way to, the way to protect ourselves, number one, is to uh, stay in circles where this type of, where basically, you know, one of our my asatida, he told me this. He said, but Purani Sochwale. Purani Sochwale is not my He said, you have to stick around with people who have a traditional old style thinking. It could even be an old 90 year old or 80 year old, 70 year old Namusa. But the old style thinking that has not been corrupted by the modern you know, age. If you have that type of group of friends, Number two, decreasing your dependency on social media and online sources. Just decreasing that. Stop just even Twitter. Just don't read it, man. Don't read it. There's no reason. Whatever you need to know, someone will call you, someone will text you, someone will email you. Mm -hmm. From Twitter to everything else, stop watching, reading stuff online. To the best of your ability. Go in person and study whatever you can. And listen, Twitter is not for studying. It's for just fun, wasting time. Yeah. Third thing is read Surah Al-Kahf every single day. The first 10 and the last 10 verses. First 10 and last 10 verses, at least, if you have the ability, the entire surah. And of course on Jummah, but I don't think this the era of Jummah. No, no, we, we got it. My Ustad 25 years ago told me, you have to read Surah Al-Kahf every day. We need to start reading Surah Al-Kahf every day. Shaykh Abdul Hassan Ali al Nadawi has a tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf called Faith versus Materialism. 80 page book. Faith versus Materialism. Alhamdulillah, I did a 16 week tafsir on, on Surah Al-Kahf some years ago, which is available from our YouTube channel. That's a great start. To start making you think in a certain manner. Because kahaf is an antidote to Dajjal because it addresses certain things. What are those things that it addresses? You have to know. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would say performing salah with jamar in the masjid as often as you can. Until. These are some of the ways, inshallah, we can protect ourselves from this fitna. We have our... Um, uh, your next one, Kadim. Everyone got this, right, brothers? Yes? All right, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the summer, many of you out of state brothers here or new brothers are here today or sisters as well who are listening online. I want you to, uh, to know that Alhamdulillah every year we have a summer in Islamic studies intensive and an Arabic intensive. These are great programs for you to solidify and have a, what I call, create a solid mindset. Right, brainwash your, your uh, remove the toxins, wash your brain from the toxins. And the one year program that you see on my left, this insha'Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, is a vaccine from the Dajjali virus. Inshallah. That's what we hope, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, it's been, mashallah, we're going to be taking in our 12th batch this year. Make dua that all of us get accepted for it. Say Ameen. Ameen. And your sisters and your brothers. We're hoping, Ameen. inshallah, that we have a large class of 125 students this year. Inshallah. And of course, my goal is for it to start up in all across the country. Mm -hmm. But it's not about just teaching Arabic. You see, that's the whole thing you've gotten from this past talks. It's not about teaching Aqidah. It's not about fit. It's, it's about what perspective are you teaching it from. The that's super important. Perspective, perspective, perspective. And so if someone asks, what's the perspective over here? The perspective is here is to make people realize the fit, the Dajjali fitna era has arrived, and now we have to pay the Dajjal, not the Dajjal, the Dajjali fitna, that predates the Dajjal. And you and I are going to prepare ourselves by studying the same text, but in the perspective that will help us be protected. So I implore all of you to make dua that these students are protected from the Dajjali fitna, Amen. and that all of you and your loved ones get a chance to study a course like this Allah here, Allah. inshallah. And that the ulama who graduate from here are able to go set up programs like these, inshallah, inshallah. across the you know across the country. I mean, yeah. We'll end with that. Um, uh, man, we have Qari Muhammad Patel here. After all, uh, where is he? Did he leave? He was right here. Huh? He was right here. Yeah. I wanted him to share, just recite a little bit. Is he here? Tell me. Inshallah. He was right here. Yeah. Okay, inshallah. <laughs>
we will, since it's already 3.15, we'll uh, just do a short dua. And end. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salamu wa barakatuh. Jalali wa al-karam. Allahumma laka alhamdu kullu wa laka shukru kullu. Allahumma la nasi thana'ana alayka anta kama athani ta'ala nafsik. Ya hayu ya qayyum, 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 ya Allah, ya Allah, ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, bi rahmatika nastaghith, bi rahmatika nastaghith, bi rahmatika nastaghith. Aslih lana sha'anana kullahu la takin la ilaha in fazana tarfata'in. O Allah, we ask you, Allah, we ask you, Allah, to protect all of us and our loved ones from the fitna of Dajjal. O Allah, we ask you to protect all of us from the fitna of today, Ya Allah. O Allah, please save our minds and hearts from becoming polluted, from being, ta- from being Ya Allah, ruined. O Allah, O Allah, I beg you, Ya Allah, allow us to be able to differentiate between right and wrong, between right and, uh, between right and wrong, between truth and evil. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, keep us on the right side of history. Allow us to always be with the truth. Allow us to always be from amongst the revivers of the truth. Allow us to be from amongst the inviters towards the truth and the followers of the truth. O oh Allah, grant us the necessary spiritual and physical protection, Ya Allah, to be able to stand, to be firm on, our, on the truth. Ya Allah, do not test us more than we can handle. Ya Allah, do not test us more than we can handle. O oh Allah, please accept the shuhada of, who are giving their life for the, because of the only fact is that they're Muslims. O oh Allah, across the globe, and all of those who are alive, from, from our brothers and sisters in Gaza and other places, Ya Allah, give them strength, give them resilience, and assist them through your invisible powers. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, grant all of us an attachment to the Qur'an, an attachment to Surah Al-Kahf, an attachment to the teachings and the, and the themes of Surah Al-Kahf. O oh Allah, make us amongst those who are able to see the deceptive methods of Iblis miles and miles away. And O oh Allah, then grant us the tools that were required to be able to protect ourselves from those deceptive methods. O oh Allah, if anything pr- appropriate was shared today, indeed it was from you. And we ask you to grant us the ability to have a deep understanding of it and ability to propagate it. O oh Allah, if any misrepresentation was done or mistakes were made, Ya Allah, we seek, we seek your forgiveness. And we ask you, Allah, to rectify the way we approach life and the way we think of life and the way we think of deen and dunya. Subhana rabbik rabbil alizati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Inshallah, the suhoor is ready. Downstairs, we can go downstairs, inshallah. Tomorrow night will be the last session, inshallah. Tomorrow night, the last candlelight session. Tomorrow is our khatm al-Quran. And Monday after Salat al-Dhuhr is also Salat the solar eclipse salah.